Hi, and welcome to this week's Mortgage Broker Broadcast. My guest this week is David Coleman from Positive Lending. And David's back on the podcast. It was originally on in February last year. Back, uh, back, it was on episode 46. Back on the podcast this time. And just to talk about, just catch up in terms of what's been going on. He's very proactive on his LinkedIn profile. So we do sort of see day to day what's going on in David's life. But I also wanted to get into a bit more detail about yeah, what's going on personally, but also about his take on the market, what's happening at Positive Lending, what trends is seeing and what the he sort of see, thinks the next sort of nine 12 months are going to look like from a, a business point of view so yeah let's just get david onto the podcast you're listening to the mortgage broker broadcast with me craig skelton the podcast which helps mortgage brokers at all stages of their mortgage broking career so welcome back onto the podcast david how are you i'm very well thank you mate good to be back it's been a while it has been a while and we had a quick chat before we hit record and, and it, it has been certainly been a while. We that You was on the podcast, the first time was episode 46, which was back in February 2022. So uh, it has been a while and so much has happened for both of us, but so much has happened for you in the last 12 months. So much has happened for you from a personal level. Obviously, we'll talk about business and things like that as well, but you've got a lot of things going on at this moment in time. There's been a lot going on, mate. Yeah, I mean, um, Henry's going to be two in June uh, and he's just growing up way too quickly as we were just talking about. Baby number two is due to arrive at the end of June. Um, I don't like making things easy for myself, do I? Um, <laughs> we've renovated our house since. We're now back in. We're trying to trying to make that into a home from a house, just trying to find the time to do that. Um, work is is ridiculously busy, but in a good way. There is a, There's a lot of lot of business coming in which which is great and was obviously what we want but um yeah. yeah a lot of plates being spun at the moment yeah like you see don't make life easy for yourself so uh, <laughs> no. is L- lauren all right and everything okay with baby number two and yeah, she's, all um, she's good thank you mate yeah she's um she's taking it like a trooper as she is that's the kind of person she is but yeah she's she's struggling a little bit with the pregnancy um but as i keep a reminder the last time we were pregnant, and I use the word "we" because I'm not carrying the baby. But um, but uh, last time that, that she was pregnant, we were in lockdown. We didn't have a toddler running around causing mayhem. We actually got a full night's sleep, um, <laughs> and we weren't out and about socialising with friends and and through work and stuff. So the the um, the landscape is very different to what it was before. But no, she's doing well, thank you. Yeah, good, good. And and Gus, all right. Gus is sort of. That's- cool. Yeah. That's all good. He's he's actually on the sofa looking at me at the moment, going, "When are we going out?" But it's just been chucking down with rain, so we're we're going to wait a while till we go out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we won't talk about the uh, the weather because it has been fairly uh, mixed right now. But no, it's good to get you back on. It's good. We've had we've sort of met. We had the the awards. I think we got to say a quick hello. We had a bit of a buggy wars going on at when Positive spent uh, sponsored the. Uh, Open work golfing event. When, when was that? I was trying to think when that was. October, wasn't it? October, like September, October last year. Okay. I think, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It does, uh, so, yeah, we've got chat. I think it's one of those things where now he's, you sort of getting to see people that you've sort of seen virtually or been following or connected with and everything else. And then it, you actually sort of getting to meet people face to face now. And I'm experiencing that. And I'm guessing you're getting out now far more than what sort of what you you have done over the past sort of years year ago or like the last year or so so um, yeah absolutely and it, it mate it's, it's so good i mean i'm i'm a big believer and there's so much value so much more value in the face-to-face don't get me wrong i think virtual sessions definitely hold um a value and a place in what we do because that's the world we live in now and actually they can be really beneficial i mean look would we be doing this otherwise no probably not um and and they definitely play a part in in the roles and and the lives we live now, to, regardless of what you're doing. But the human interaction and seeing, but you know, we, we'd never met before the golf day, and we'd we'd spoken loads virtually, online, and stuff like that. So to meet you in person and you know smash up a couple of golf buggies together was good fun. <laughs> I think that's the thing is because even though you like I felt as though I know you, and obviously we've we've met virtually so many times, it, it then just when when you do meet me and we didn't finally meet face to face, it just slipped into a natural, just very. It wasn't as though you met me and somebody new for the first time, and I think that's the thing with with virtual. I think it is it does bridge that gap from the 
uncomfortable silence at the beginning when it's sort of like when you first meet and the hands are shaking and then you're thinking, I've got to, I'm sort of building a bit of rapport with this person. I don't know what they're like. I don't know what the personality is like. And you, it, it takes that guessing thing out. So when, so what I'm finding is when I'm having the face to face meetings, you're straight in, like it's, you don't waste time. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, just like the icebreaker's gone. The icebreaker's gone because the icebreaker is what you know about the person online. And that, obviously, that doesn't tell you everything about them, but you kind of had an understanding about the individual that's standing in front of you. You don't have to make, you know, no one has to think of that really quirky opening line or that awkward moment of whatever, because you know, you know, there's people meet me and the first thing typically they say is, How's that baby boy? How's Henry? Brilliant. Um, and, and listen, I could sit there and talk about it all day, so that's perfect for me. But yeah, that icebreaker bit is already there. There's no, there's no awkwardness around it. Definitely, and I think so, sometimes brokers miss that. From I know from a point of view, they're not going to interact sort of per se on virtual with through Teams and things like that with their clients. But if they are posting and if they are putting the personalities out there and they are sort of explain educating their clients potential clients and then talking about a little bit about themselves as well when they do meet face to face and they do get that lead and they do get that referral and they're picking up that phone the cus from a customer point of view there's a little bit of report already there even though there's not from the broker to the client because obviously the clients reached out to them on the back of what they've been doing but i think brokers miss out on on that it sort of led me nicely to that, which I, I've just sort of linked that together quite well. But I, and, I, and I didn't think like that before because it's a case, well, actually the, the client feels as though they know the broker already. So the client will be more relaxed if it is a virtual or you're sat in, they come into the office or the, you're meeting them at home, in, in their home, then the customer's going to be naturally a bit more relaxed. So they feel as though they know you already because yep. they've sort of seen a bit about your personality. They've seen who you are on social media. They've followed you and connected you. So, again, from a broker's point of view, you're more likely to convert that business because the customer feels that they, they know you already. So, um, so yeah. I think our, our industry, <clears throat> regardless of if you're talking B2B or B2C, is built on relationships. And Absolutely. inevitably, you're going to side or partner with or choose to work with or work closer with people that you actually connect with or you resonate or they resonate with you. So it's exactly what you just said is spot on because, you know, personalities, different personalities. You, you, we've got advisors in the office and I've got brokers that will specifically say, actually, I, I want to deal with that individual because I get on really well with that person over the other advisors that are all very competent and they, they can do exactly the same job. But there's that connection there and they want to deal with that person. So you're 100 percent, you know, people buy from people. That is a cheesy line, but it, but it is factual. It's true, isn't it? Definitely. And we've gone straight into the podcast. We knew this was going to happen. We've done no introductions and things like that. Literally, but everybody knows who you are anyway. So literally, we've just gone straight into it. And uh, obviously, it's yeah, always the best way. So yeah. from a posi- from a positive lending point of view, you, the team's expanded over that. You, you obviously, you've got Andy, who I met, I've met. You've, yeah. you've got Oliver now in the South. Is that That's of- right, Nick. Yeah, yeah. So the team's, yeah, a, a big part of, a, well, a massive part of what we do is, is servicing the intermediary market and supporting them, keeping them up to speed with what's going on in the market. Because you'll know yourself from looking after your, your business and your team that you have areas of the business that specialise in, you know, whether it's a resi or buy-to-let side of things. But your typical mortgage will deal with that, and that's their bread-and-butter business. So us keeping them up to, to speed with the more specialist parts of the market is where we step in. And obviously, in the current climate, the specialist market is really playing prevalent in, in supporting clients. And actually, there's more call on it, there's more need on it. And brokers are now sort of opening up their minds to go, actually, I need to know more about this stuff because there's more client demographic that is going to need these kind of solutions to support them. No, definitely. I, I totally agree with you. And I think that's, I've talked before on the podcast and we'll, we'll have a quick chat in a second about your take on the year so far, sort of three months in. But I think, like I said, I've talked about it before where there are going to be less clients in 2023 from a broker's point of view. But that's actually a good thing because you've got more time to do the right thing with those clients and go to the end of the earth to f- provide them with a solution rather than just sort of, and, and things like obviously working with yourself and, and positive, it's then understanding what those options are and then reaching out to you guys, knowing actually this has got the client scenario, This is whereas normally they just go, no, I can't help you and I'll move on to the next lead and the next client. They're having a bit more time to explore the solutions for clients, which is 
all about being a broker. That's how, that's being a broker. And that's what you should be. Uh, you, you should be providing that service and going to that nth degree for your client that's bothered actually to reach out to you and contact you in the first place. And I think that's it. I think that I think the 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 purchase market overall is still very active. I think it's a lot more difficult on a couple of couple of variables. One. You know, the rates, as we all know, have increased and that affects affordability. So, you know, there's going to be more deposits needed or actually things just don't fit or work. Now, clients' demographic is changing as well and criteria is changing. So that means that maybe the purchase is impossible. Um, and we've been, as an industry and probably as a, as a broker, very fortunate that the market has been buoyant uh, and there's been a lot of people wanting to buy. Rates have been very low. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a fairly, and I, I use this word flippantly, but easy job overall because business has been flowing in. Um, and now it's not as busy in certain areas because of everything that we're going through. You know, the cost of living, rate hikes and everything else that we're all experiencing are having an effect on business level. But as we mentioned just before we started this, there's plenty of gold out in those hills. Um, you just need to know how to look for it, where to look for it and want to look for it. Um, and that's where we come in and what we're doing, supporting brokers in the market is actually helping to recognize those opportunities for brokers to say, look, if you've got this client demographic and you've got these in your client bank, there is business in there and they probably will appreciate a phone call uh, or communication from you. And that communication will probably turn into business and that business we can support you with. I think that's it. It's like you said there about wanting to do it. It's like with regards to Resi just being, it's coming in, they've got plenty of leads, the abundance there of things coming in. So they've not had to actually educate themselves. And we talked about this like on the podcast last year where we, like there's a lot of brokers that have joined the industry, see my one in the hand and are still learning to be like, I've sort of seen it firsthand where you've got brokers that are, coming in inexperienced and having the help and support, but still deciding that broken wasn't them for them and leaving the industry because it is a little bit more difficult than what they envisaged it would be kind of thing. Um, and then so you've got those people that are leaving. So that there is a more need for a broker than ever before from a client point of view, but it's actually, like you said there, it's about wanting those clients. And I think, because we're scared, if we like, if it's the, not the norm we deal with, and it's, we've never never dealt with that before, it's like, well, we might shy away from those sorts of things. But then having the relationship with you or one of the team at Positive, and knowing actually there is a place, there is, there is a space for these clients and a place to place them as well. Because and having that relationship with you and with Andy and Oliver and, and the rest of the team is then knowing that actually there's a solution and that. that it is about educating those brokers, which I know that you're doing because, and that's the thing with it. They, they, it's, they, it was, it's not a one shoe fits all kind of thing. Of like not every client's got 15% deposit and the first time buyers and everything sort of very straightforward. People come to a broker for a reason. And generally being that they want somebody to piece this all together yep. and just work like working with you. It's like knowing that that's actually an option, but the brokers have got to want to have the, sort of generate those clients and generate those leads in the first place to then feel comfortable to then reach out to you and then that will bridge that gap you you educating and doing what you're doing and getting on the road and, and really posit, like promoting the options and the way that you fulfill the market is then well that's great and that and brokers should be reaching out and educating themselves on the back of that yeah absolutely and i think you used the word scared there which which i, I do feel comes into play quite a lot because you know, you can't be a master of all trades. Um, you're going to be you know, a master of one or two, and then that's it. And a lot of the time, businesses may be overlooked or passed away simply because the confidence isn't there. But a broker doesn't need to be an expert in a second charge mortgage or a bridge or whatever it may be that we're looking at for them. They just need to know how to recognise the opportunity. And then myself or one of my team or the team internally are there to provide that experience and that knowledge off the back of it and help the client that help the broker understand what is possible so they can go back to their client and support them because when you look at it no no client ever picks up the phone to a broker and says i'd love fifty thousand for a second charge mortgage or i'd love a bridging loan they go i need x amount of money and it's the broker's job as their role then to find out the best solution for that client whatever that looks like um and then that's where we come into play because i think the current market at the moment obviously 
there's a lot more stuff that is quirky, doesn't fit the mainstream. That's probably going to increase as well. There's probably, sadly, going to be more adverse in the market. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all going to lead into more specialist solutions that fall outside of that high street mainstream mold. Uh, but the thing is, like, when you, if you provide that, it's easy to, and we see it as a business where we get clients coming in and it's a case of like, I've been to another broker, I can't, they've, they've said no, there's no option for me. And then actually you provide that option and that solution for that client because you do that bit more digging. And that's nothing against the past broker, the previous broker, they might not have been educated, they might be new into the industry, they could just be, they could just been see the bank and just be in the case of no, we can't help you kind of thing. So it is about, like you say, taking themselves out of that comfort zone from a broker point of view and learning about what options are because they don't want to feel stupid when they get that lead or that client coming in. They don't want to feel stupid. They don't want to feel as though they don't know. Yeah. But you're breathing loyalty. And, and the thing is with that, you get one client who you provide a solution for that's been told no elsewhere. You've got they're going to stick life. with you for life. And they're yeah. going to be telling every man in down the pub, every friend, every family that you're the broker to speak to and that's you how you handle your business yeah i mean and, and that's exactly it the client you know a client speaking to a broker to find a solution as I said like they don't know what they want they don't know what they they know how much they want they probably know what their end goal is they don't know how they're getting there and they don't know the best way to do it and like you said if, if a client's speaking to a lender directly which is probably a more mainstream lender because that's what they would have access to and that lender says no because it doesn't fit their criteria it doesn't mean there isn't options for them in the market it just means it might take a different direction might be a more specialist solution um but at the end of the, at the end of the day the client the broker comes in and where we come in absolutely are you so in terms of the 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 first three months of the year so far from a from a business point of view what are you sort of seeing trends are you sort of like what are you helping brokers out with what sort of yeah how are you sort of finding the first three months yeah there's so i mean like back end of last year before christmas i was kind of you know sort of having conversations with brokers saying i think the start of the year might be a little bit quieter it's probably going to it's not all doom and gloom there's green shoots out there you know things will pick up and yeah, inevitably Pretty much from, I was back on the 4th, from the 5th, my phone did not stop ringing. It was like everyone sat at home at Christmas and had contacted their brokers and the new year had gone, right, I want to do this. So I think what we're seeing at the moment on the first charge side of things, um, there's a lot of activity. Conversion isn't as high as we're, we're used to, but then I think there is a element of consumer confidence in the market where actually clients are saying, um, and unfortunately they're not, you know, they're not aware that things aren't really going to go back to those one, two percent rates. We're not getting them back, maybe not in our lifetimes. Who knows? It could be. But, you know, inevitably, the, the rates are not going to be as low as what we've been privileged to. And I think maybe once the budget is out the way tomorrow, you know, the next um, Bank of England decision, um, you know, those kind of factors will come in and maybe that will you know level things out a little bit. So uh, there's a lot of activity. Um, but I think once the market and I say the market consumers actually kind of get to the understanding we are where we are you know and that four percent that five percent rate is actually what you can achieve and the conversation now changes from what's the best rate you can get to is it affordable and do you want it i think that's that there's a different conversation now but where we've been busiest is in second charge mortgages um because actually there's so many variables around that one you know clients that are on a one one and a half percent rate well they're not going to re want to refinance right now up to a four or five percent rate because they're not they're going to lose that rate so they'll capital raise with a second charge the amount of fixed rate products in the market it's a two and five year fix there's still a good amount of them in the market and obviously typically they come with a high early repayment charge so to avoid that they can capital raise on a second charge debt consolidation i think every one of us you and i included are probably looking at our outgoings in one way or another going Right, I've just got my gas bill. My gas bill come through in January and it's 600 quid. And I'm like, whoa, what's happening here? Um, and it's not as though we're sitting in here in our shorts and bikinis uh, having a lovely <laughs> time outside. We're, we're, we're being sensible. So I think everyone's reviewing their outgoings and it's not unusual to see at the moment of, you know, a second charge mortgage coming through for debt consolidation, probably of £40,000 upwards. I mean, last week we had one complete. There was £120,000, all unsecured credit. Um, and you can imagine the outgoings for that client and what we, we're able to reduce that to. So we're seeing that come through. And then the affordability models, obviously, 
I know on the high street, you know, you're probably looking at still achieving five and a half times with some ten lenders, but actually it's not actually five and a half times because once it starts going through it, it's probably nearer the five or lower or, you know, et cetera. Yeah. So we're seeing a lot more second charge mortgage activity. Bridging has gone berserk. Um, that, that market is so buoyant, the regulated side of the market as well. But again, we're seeing more chain breaks. Um, you've right. got clients that are maybe speaking to a broker and that broker has secured them a better rate end of that term. So they need to secure that property or, or they'll lose that rate. So they're using a the bridge to purchase. Um, there's more clients now looking to downsize, maybe of a, a, a later life client, but they're looking to downsize simply because of the cost of running that property now. Um, but they'll purchase pre-sale. We have been looking at bridging finance for landlords. Uh, because, as we all know, the buy-to-let market is a very, very tough market at the moment. A lot of stuff doesn't pass ICR. Um, and if it is, you know, are you looking at a lender that's maybe got a, a much higher um, arrangement fee or lender fee? Or if it does, is it actually affordable? So actually, a, yeah, a bridging loan is still very competitively priced compared to the rest of the market. So we're seeing a lot more activity in there. Um, and commercial. Commercial is still very active, although rates are reflecting in the rest of the market so that that's a conversation of can it be done a lot of the time it is yes but is it right for the client does it work for the client that's that's a different conversation um and we've moved into equity release as well which is proving i mean that the amount of interest only mortgages in the market that have no exit um and the demographic of client um is seeing i mean we, we haven't even really launched properly as an official um promotion to the market as such but the the inquiries are coming in thick and fast so there's obviously a need for that kind of product in the market as well so like i think we were talking before where where certain parts of the business are quieter than what we would usually expect actually they're being propped up or overly propped by other areas and to be fair, I, I saw that with regards to equity release and i did want to get your sort of i wanted to know more about it because that was just something because we as a business we do equity release from cs Point of view, we do equity release. We've got an equity, equity release advisor. We're sort of seeing that there is a definitely a, a sort of a, a more need for that product now than probably ever before. And I think that will only go one way. And I'm seeing more brokers I'm talking to are looking at doing the CRER kind of thing as well and having that tool in the tool bag to having that option. So is that something new? Into we obviously you've sort of said it's new. Is it sort of something that's been on the go for a while with regards to equity release, how does that sort of fit with the rest of positive? Yes, I mean, I think it's, it's been a few months now since we've been offering it as a solution. I mean, we're whole of market, so we've got a full panel of all the lenders. Um, but we actually kind of fell into exploring X really release a little bit more because um, we ended up doing a number of bridging deals for clients that wanted equity release right. and there was an issue with their property either it, yeah it was deemed not suitable for for lending on effectively for whatever reason and obviously due to the client's demographic their age their income etc they were unable to obtain finance which means they lose out on the pro they lost out on the property sorry so actually we were doing a bridging loan for that that client with an equity release as the exit so actually we thought why, why are we not keeping this all in-house it makes for a much smoother customer journey um, we can place it all together. We can speak to all the lenders at the same time to make sure all of our ducks are lined up and actually give the client exactly what they need and want. So that's how we kind of came into it. But also the equity release, and you, you might be seeing this as well, there are going to be a lot of um, clients that are looking to capital raise for gifted deposits for their for their family, for their children yeah. to get onto the housing market. So we're seeing that in the second charge world. But obviously if you're looking at a later life client, well then, you know, the second charge maybe doesn't work for them. So equity release, they'll be doing that to release funds and capital so they can get their child, children onto the property ladder because things are a much tougher environment for that now. No, definitely. I think we're also like from, we're seeing from that point of view, we're also seeing not so much. I think the thing is, like you said before about the downsizing with the equity, with equity release, we're seeing more people that are, debt consolidation, just clearing off those little bits. So they're not like, because obviously the rates are reflective in the equity release market as they are in the commercial, as they are in the residence. Yeah. The level, the levels of rates are slightly different to what they were 12 months ago. 
And so, but he's still saving that client, that monthly outgoing of maybe that loan or that credit card, those credit cards and things like that. And because of the society, of society and how we are, we are used to having debt and credit card debt and, and unsecured debt. And I think that's from a, even the later life lending, even people that are retired and, and still have credit cards, still have those debts, still have those loans. And I'm just starting to now realize that actually equity release is an option for them rather than burying their head in the sands and thinking in the sand and thinking, I can't cope with this. What what can I do? What's my option? So these we're sort of seeing that re, I, as well with regards to uh, debt con. And I think again, that will only grow. grow. It will only grow because that's as society. We, I think we'll lose the like. Like we talked before the the podcast, my son's like seventeen. He like I think we, I think our generation, I'm saying my generation, my generation is the last one being polite. There, my generation is we we don't expect any sort of inheritance or anything like that. I think that's that we're the last generation where that's the that kind of mindset. Whereas my parents I expect to leave something to the children, whereas. Yeah. Like I won't be in that mindset kind of thing. It will be a case of well, you've just like you, you've got time, and there'll be a lot of things in place to help that. So, um, but my point is is that we're finding more, like more people are going to be taking equity release just to fund their later life. People haven't been putting into pensions. People are used to a certain lifestyle. People are used to a certain income, and we're seeing it from a pension point of view, where people are realizing too late. Yeah, well, I can't well, rely on the state. Yeah. And what, what am I going to do? And the only one. The main option is they sat there with 200, 300, 400,000 pounds of equity in the property. So, well, that is the option. That, that's the option yeah. you get to, to, to increase your yeah. standard of living. And, and, and why not in terms of the, the way that we promote wellness and mindset and everything else? Thinking, well, you do want to keep that accustomed to that lifestyle of having those holidays and doing all those things. So, um, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you touched on debt con there. And I think, what we're seeing uh, and and hearing from the market is that actually transferring balances on credit cards is a lot more difficult now. You could have a, a good credit score, you could be a good earner. It is not as easy to flip around <clears throat> as it was because <clears throat> the landscape's changed. And there's more there's more stringent criteria coming in. So, and that's putting people a little bit in tricky water when they're looking to you know reshuffle their finances. And they're now looking, you know, as as is everyone, looking at their outgoings and going, actually, how can I reduce this down? How can I? Um, so yeah, I think we'll we'll only see more and more of that going forward. We we will when you look at the personal lending point of view, the rates that that were loans were four percent, four point nine, five percent kind of thing. Those are now eight point nine, nine percent. So the people are then. Like you say, it's not a case of I've got my credit card, I'll I'll get a loan and, and consolidate them all together, personal point of view, because the rates are less favourable now. And and that's the thing, it's just getting used to those kind of rates. And like I say, it's um debt con I think is gonna be a, a big thing. Like it, it will continue to be a thing that grows. Absolutely. And and I think that we we've, we've seen this a again. <clears throat> you were looking at rates of three, three and a half percent upwards. Now you're looking at rates of seven percent upwards, um, but the conversation isn't rate driven because if you've got someone who's got fifty thousand of of unsecured debt or whatever that may be, and they're paying a thousand pound a month, and you can get that payment to three hundred pounds a month, the rate to a degree it is always important, obviously, and it is relevant. But it is irrelevant because it's the immediate benefit that that product puts. It's an extra seven hundred pounds in their pocket. In that example. Um, and that's what it comes down to. It, the, the rate is almost redundant in the conversation. It's what what is this going to give me here and now? And you know when you're looking at something like a second charge or along those lines, well, typically the broker is part of that customer journey, probably you know, 48 months onwards, and they'll be looking to see if they can refinance that maybe back into a mainstream mortgage because the kind of circumstances have changed and actually it will better their situation going forward as well. So, you know, from the, from the broker's point of view, you get two bites of the cherry. From the client's point of view, they get the immediate benefit with the future potential of bettering their, their situation. No, definitely. And so in terms of, we talked a little bit about that with regards to the, the 
the rate, like the the Bank of England base rates and things like that. What's your sort of? And everybody's had like people ask me this same question. It's like, well, should, like, would you do a, would a if it was you, would you do a two year fix to five year fix now? From my up, like from yep. the resi point of view, what's your sort of take on the the market for the for the rest of for, certainly for the next three months, but then for the for twenty twenty three. Yeah, well, I think uh, like regards. I mean, look, my my I've got two part mortgage, and um, my fixed is coming to an end in the next couple of months. I think it is, uh, and I'm a little bit of a quandary as well. But I mean, I, I'm I'm going to hedge my bets uh, and probably go with a discount tracker with no ERC. It's going to cost me a grand to have that product, but it is what it is. We are where we are, yeah. um, because I do think that things aren't going to get much worse. They might, they might get a little bit worse before they get better, but inevitably they will get better. Um, swap rates are all over the place again at the moment. They keep yeah. going up, going down, going up, going down. Um, the Bank of England base rate, will it go up again? Probably, but by how much? Maybe maybe it's a quarter of a percent. Um, mm. But I, I think once the budget's been delivered um, and depending how that's how that's received, obviously, um, then things will begin to level out a little bit. And it, it really, with, with the mortgage market, it is down to consumer confidence. And because there are, we've been privileged to low, low rates for so long, um, and it's been very easy to achieve a, for, yeah, a mortgage when you, when you need one, really. Um, it, I think it's, it's going to take a while for that to sink in to someone who isn't in the industry, who isn't a mortgage broker, who, who isn't working with mortgage day in, day out, you know, as, as, a, as a Joe Public looking to buy their first property or, you know, refinance or whatever it may be. It's going to take a while for that to sink in, but it, it just needs the dust to settle, really. And then, as I say, and I, I think it's the same with a mortgage as it is with, like I just explained on the second charge, the rate of the rate is almost redundant in the conversation. Is it affordable? And do you want that property? That's what the conversation is. Um, and where do you go with that? And, that? and that's where we are. I mean, personally, myself, I, I would probably wouldn't be taking a fixed rate product at the moment because I think they will probably improve um, over the next year or two. So if if you're confident enough to, to do what I'm going to do, then I'd probably go with that. But that's not my advice. I'm not a mortgage broker either, but um, I'm just hedging my bets. I could end up with custard pie all over my face, but, um, but that's where we are. So... I didn't realise I've got Dave, uh, um, Martin Lewis on the podcast today, David. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm not. I'm joking from that. But, but I think the thing is, it is very difficult to predict right now because I think it is down to, like you said, it's down to affordability. Is 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 do we do a two year fix, a five year fix? It's all like I'm I'm with you. <laughs> like I've got part and part. We moved like eighteen months ago. We've got part and part going on. Like part and part. We've got like two products going on. I was coming to an end. We got the letter the other day from that West, and it's just a case. And we're in the industry, and then you're thinking, in the open, the letter is like, yep, yep, and that's going to equate to this. And what can we do? And where can we? And like I said, people are going to look to sort of save money in other areas, such as debt con and, and the rest of that. And I think that's just sort of the big thing for me as a broker is it's about piecing it together and getting that, like you said, the affordability of a client. So the client knows that it's X amount of pounds per month and is looking at those options in terms of what's right for them and what's affordable for them. And maybe that is extending the term or looking at other things, looking at other options, whether they like, say, and it's having that ability and skill as a broker to think like that, but who knows what is going to happen? Like you say, we've got interest rates, like the bank of England, we've got budgets, we've got, it's just, I'm 100% with you. The dust just needs to settle. I think that's, it's, but that's always the case. It's just that the dust needs to settle. Let's get the swap rates back to some sort of like some sort of stability yep. that will then influence the market. We've got everything going on. Like I say, we are four weeks in ahead with this podcast, but like we've got the stuff going on in Silicon Valley right now with regards to the rates, the the, the, the businesses that are out there and the banks that are out there and HSBC buying and bark. Like there's all different things sort of going on, which I know consumers day to day won't understand how that affects the mortgage market. They're just interested in how what their mortgage rate is. But I think from a broker point of view, you need to be in dialogue with your client very, very early. Like you just need, you need to be case of and I think that's across everything. I mean, it, you, you, your new clients that are coming to you and looking to get onto the property market, 
um, they need to kind of be, I, I think, nurtured a little bit more now because the understanding of what's going in the market is probably very alien to them. What's going on? Why is it different to 12 months ago? Why has my friend got a, a 1% rate and you're, you're offering me 5%, for example? Um, and then the existing client bank as well, which is, is a message that we've kind of been delivering in our presentations and our roadshows and stuff like that. You know, what, what's your client existing client bank look like at the moment? You know, how many of them have got a two year or five year fixed? How many of them have had their circumstances changed since you last spoke to them? When did you last speak to them? Because they probably need help. They probably want help. Do they know they can get help? Do they know that they can they can better their situation? They're things that you know the general consumer probably isn't going to be aware of, and that's where the broker's value really comes into it. You know, people's life change all the time. You know, they they lose their job, they get a new job, they get divorced. You know, things happen. They get sick. You know, things. You know, they, they've taken out that nice new big car that they're paying 600 pound a month on the drive and, and all of a sudden their mortgage has gone up by 400 quid and their gas bill has gone up by 200 quid or whatever and all of a sudden that that car is becoming very unattractive can they can they do something about that can they look at their outgoings can they all of those conversations you know have they got protection is their protection so there's so many variables and, and a reason to pick up the phone to a client that's already on the books and not leave it to the 11th hour when their product's about to run out. Because the way the market is at the moment, there's, as we said earlier, there's gold out there. Um, and I think your general consumer isn't going to be aware that actually maybe they can do something or they need to do something to better their situation. That's where a broker can really add value to their clients. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. It's about product. And it's not just a case of, like you say, it's about being proactive. It's about being proactive with your client bank, even though the deal, their deal might be, not up until for a couple of like two years or 18 months yet or, or a year, he's still reaching out to those clients and knowing that you've got their back. And I think one thing that I've sort of noticed in going back to what something you sort of said there about normality and with first time buyers and people that don't know is that you say their friend might have got a, a rate of 2% 12 months ago. And then you're yeah. talking, they're looking at buying, they've saved the deposit, looking at buy a house, and then you're talking about four and five percent is sort of like, well, I'm a minute. Well, like that's a big deal. And as well, you also have the parent if you're looking to have parents involved with it as well, the parents are living in the background whether they've had a mortgage or paid the mortgage off or still in a mortgage that they secured yeah. two years ago on a five year fix. And then you're talking as a broker to this first time buyer saying your interest rate is going to be five percent. And they're going on, they're showing the mom and dad and mom and dad's going, What? Like you need yeah. to find somebody else. You need to and it's about been it's educating your client and educating that third party to then understand that this is what's happening. So if it is involving all these kind of parties to sort of bring it together to make sure that we because we, we, I, I am noticing that some of the brokers are experiencing clients that are just shopping around. It is very much of just bouncing around for the best rate, not about yeah. services. Bounce, and you've got to take that client by the scuff of the neck and sort of say, look. This is what I offer. This is the market. This is how it is. And if there is any other third party, you've got to get those involved with it as well. And so, yeah. like, well, if your mom and dad are saying that, let's let's get them in. Let's get them as part of this process because Absolutely. then you'll end up with their remortgage or their protection or their later life lending or whatever the case may be. So it's just a constant education that this is where there is a bit of uncertainty, but it will the dust will settle. But this is not going to settle in the same place where it was. 12 months ago, he just like exactly. or two years where he won. And I think there's, there's, it's probably fair to say that, you know, over the last, God knows how long, but let, let, let's say the last five years, the majority of conversations from a broker to a client is, do you want a two or five year fixed? That is it, right? That, that's yeah. the conversation. Um, and also, if you're below the age of 40 or around that, you've probably never seen a rate increase in your lifetime. So it's all a bit of a shock to the system because we haven't experienced it. We've been very privileged, very lucky. So, things have, have dramatically changed and i think that conversation needs to be opened up more with with you know the end client because they're not aware they don't know that and, and let's be honest we when we're looking at something it doesn't matter whether you know what it is a loan a mortgage whatever we want the best product we want the best rate we want the best offering but it's understanding this is what you're going to get now um and, the, and this is a situation you take the analogy if you look at you go into the car showroom your finance could be on 14 nice shiny new car don't you 
you know, how, is that payment going to be affordable for me? So it's yeah. kind of looking at it from that perspective. You know, how much do you want that house? Can you afford it? That's where the broker is going to come in and say, I done, we've done a presentation recently and I think it's uh, 12, if you take sort of around about 12 months ago, the difference in what you could achieve um, when looking at properties, about 130 grand difference now because of affordability models. So it's changed that dramatically over that period of time. So that just shows that the bank of mum and dad is becoming become, become more prevalent. Clients are going to need more money. It's much tougher now as a younger person because how are you ever going to afford to save for a deposit? Mm -hmm. You know, rental is at record highs. Um, yeah, cost of living is at record highs everything is going up other than people's salaries. That's the only thing that's not changed, isn't it? So, you know, everything's going out and there's not a lot more coming in. So, yeah, the, I think that the market's changed and the conversations have changed, really. But that's where, you know, that awareness and education from, from the, the broker side comes into play. And inevitably, lenders will adapt to the market. You know, lenders need to get money out the door. That's what they're there to do. If they're not lending, they haven't got a business model. Yeah. So... I, again, we use the, the phrase once the dust settles, but once the dust settles, well, then we'll probably see more innovation from lenders coming out and they'll adapt their criteria to suit and work because. Yeah, they have, well, they have to, because like you said, that's their business model, that's how yeah. they make money. So yeah. they've, they've got to, absolutely. Yeah. So, what, um, in terms of, like you sort of said about there, just moving on slightly, in terms of, Road shows. I've seen you at the Etihad. I've seen on social media. I've seen you at Watford. Well, that's a local one, isn't it? Well, I've just realised it was nice and easy for me. Two minutes down the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, in terms of, um, are you out doing road shows? Are you doing web? Like, what? How sort of the message of getting out there to the brokers right now from positive? Yes, yeah, so, I mean the road shows were built specifically around that. Is really inviting brokers to a free half day out. Um, but with a view of meeting lenders in the market that we work with across all, all product ranges. Um, and then also giving our take of what we're seeing in the market. What And, and let's be honest, I think every expert, and, and I use the expert as, as uh, people that I look up to and would listen to in the industry, everyone I've seen stand up recently has said, I'm going to talk to you about what I think is but I really don't know what's going on because we all know that that could literally change overnight. And we've all experienced that over the last few years. But I think it's, it's really kind of an understanding about what we've seen, where we are, what we predict is going to happen or what we think is going to happen. And really how we can part, play part of supporting those brokers in that journey. And then myself and the team are out visiting brokers face to face or, or doing virtual sessions like this. But there's more face to face stuff happening now where we're going out and holding sessions with them, either on a one to one or with their team to basically show that these are this is what we're working on in the market. This is business that we're helping other brokers with. If other brokers are doing it, you need to be aware of it, because if you're not, your competition is probably picking up your business. So, you know, let us help you understand the opportunities. Like I said earlier, you don't need to be an expert in it. We're the experts. You just need to know, light bulb moment. I've got, I think I've got a solution for this. Let's pick up the phone to Dave, have a conversation. Is it something we can work with? If it's yes, it means you can support that client. It's a win-win. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. It's just having that tool in your tool bag, knowing yeah. that you, can, you know what that tool does and how it works. You don't need to know the ins and outs of exactly how it was produced and things like that. But you understand that that tool's there and, and use it if the situation and, and the right. And the thing is as well, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, Dave, it's about reaching out to you and the team because you are... <laughs> like you are based on like rapport and it is about education and you're not going to sort of be sort of frowning down the phone thinking what why is this person ringing me they've got no idea kind of thing it's not that's not about you or, or the brand or the business so uh, i think that's important to have that rapport. the amount of conversations i have i mean i had two of them yesterday broke a phone me dave i'm really sorry for phoning you about this well firstly don't apologize that's what i'm here for two I don't think you're going to be able to help with this. Do you know what? We could help with both of them. It took a different direction to what they thought it would be, but there yeah. is a solution. So do you know what? This is this is what it looks like. Go back to your client. Do you know what? Both of them are in my inbox this morning. Yep, actually, the client's interested in doing it. Can you put me in contact with your team? That's right. exactly that. Now, now, put them in contact with the actual experts in the office and they can speak to the, <laughs> speak to the broker and let them know what we can do. So it's, there is... No, I always kind of say that if, it, if there's something you can't place or you're struggling to place, pick up the phone, you've got nothing to lose from doing that. A exactly. conversation could turn into a maybe and a maybe turns into a yes. And as you said at the beginning, which is 100% spot on, if you can help a client 
that's been turned down elsewhere or thinks they can't do it and you can find a solution, you've got a client for life. It is as simple as that. They'll come back to you. They'll spread the word. You're going to get in, it, repeat business off them. You're going to get introduced business off them as well. Exactly. Dave, thank you so much for your time. And we'll leave it on that sort of very poignant note, shall we say. And uh, uh, But like I say, it is um, about reaching out. We'll obviously tag you into the post so people that are do want to be educated, do want to know more. If they're not following you and don't see your posts already on LinkedIn, then I don't know who they are because uh, <laughs> I see the interaction that you do get with everything that you put on there. So, uh, But thanks for agreeing to come back on and thanks for your time and thanks, thanks for being very open, honest and just trusting again in terms of very conversational with no agenda on the, on the podcast. No, thank you for having me back, mate. It's always a pleasure. Um, really, really enjoy it every time. Good. Thanks very much for your time. Cheers, mate. Catch up soon. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Mortgage Broker Broadcast, the podcast which helps mortgage brokers at all stages of their mortgage broking career. If you have any questions about this podcast or any topics you want us to discuss, or if you're interested in working with me further, then please get in touch.